everyone. Welcome to another episode of TapSwipeClick.com. In this episode, we meet someone who started out as a rock star, but then became a designer, developer, owned his own shop, and then sold it all to travel the world. Please welcome to the show, Jason... Jason... Jason Langer... Like how do you pronounce your last name? Langsdorf. What he said. Jason! Welcome to, I don't know what episode this is, I'll add that in. <laughs> <laughs> episode, uh, insert, insert here. Insert here, I'll do a voiceover. <laughs> <laughs> so, I've in, interviewed a lot of designers, a couple of researchers, and you're the first fed. Okay. Um, but I don't think that really, I don't want to put you in that box. I, if you can introduce yourself to the group, oh, what you uh, do, what you have done. How you, yeah. how you describe yourself? So I, I come from kind of a weird background mm -hmm. where I, I started out as a musician. Mm -hmm. That was what I wanted to be. Um, mm -hmm. I thought I was going to be a rock star. I had my, my super cool band and we were, we were going to change the world. Um, but we didn't make any money because we were terrible. But in that process, we had to come up with all this stuff. We had to come up with tour posters and t-shirts and, and MySpace pages and all this different a lot of design at first, yeah. right? And so I, I started just stepping into that role. I learned how to use, I, you know, I pirated my first version of Photoshop and mm -hmm. I, I got, did some tour posters. So and back I, then. I, learned, uh, yeah. I learned how to do MySpace and, mm -hmm. and I started customizing MySpace banners. And, mm -hmm. you know, as, as the band went on, we got a little more serious and, and I was having fun doing the MySpace stuff. So I built us a web page and then from the web page, I, I like expanded out and was like, well, I need a way to do a database so that uh, the other band members can like update the blog. And, and so I learned how to do content management. Mm -hmm. So it kind of was like a this like slow creep toward being a developer. Mm -hmm. um, and then when I got out of the band, I was like, oh, well, I've learned all these skills. Maybe I can do this for a living. So I started freelancing. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I've kind of been somebody wearing like all the hats. Yeah since the beginning mm -hmm. um and you know it's it so i guess the part that i would say i have the deepest level of skill in would be development mm -hmm. uh, but i still prefer you know like I, I still design my own website when i do that and i still uh, i still like to sell things mm -hmm. and market stuff mm -hmm. and talk to users and figure out how to make things better right. it's just right. that's not my core competency yeah I, when i met you i i saw like oh People like look at his website. He's doing so much more. I was like, and I was like, oh, like the remote work. Oh yeah, the, yeah, yeah. the businesses behind that. Mm -hmm. um, do you, uh, that was what you were doing before we met. Are you like talk about maybe some of your entrepreneurial or business sure. things that you're working on? Um, so after I got out of the band, I, mm -hmm. I moved into uh, running a freelance shop, which mm -hmm. over time grew into being a full on agency. Um, I had at, at its peak, we had like 12 people. Mm -hmm. Um, usually we ran closer to like four or five cause I'm not a very good manager. Uh, that is not a competency of mine. And so we, we would run with about, you know, one or two designers and, uh, one or two people to kind of project manage mm -hmm. and, uh, one or two developers. Um, and I would usually fill whichever role mm -hmm. needed to be filled. I would kind of step in there. Um, so it was the agency, we did a lot of small to medium business websites, and that grew into doing some agency work, which is how I got involved in some of my first Fortune 500 sites, built a couple Black Friday sites and things like that for big companies. Um, and from there, got into like consulting. Um, I, I burned out really hard, I had a, a lot of work-life balance issues, you know, when I was in my agency it was... 70 to 90 hour weeks and, and just working myself to the bone and mm -hmm. I got sick to the point where uh, my beard started falling out just kind of in clumps and mm -hmm. I, I like lost the ability to grow a beard it was terrifying um, and so I, I from there decided to really back it off I sold my agency I went to uh, work for uh, as a contractor for a single company a uh, company out of Toronto called Precision Nutrition mm -hmm. and while I was working at PN because their work was it was a, a very normal workload, so I was able to do it in you know six hours a day, right. which left me plenty of time to work on hobby stuff. Mm -hmm. And so I, I was, um, at the time, my partner and I had gone and given up a lease on our house and just started living out of a bag. So we were in uh, 
Airbnbs around the world, kind of between Europe and Asia, um, just seeing what was out there because we didn't, you know, we'd only ever lived in a couple places. We were like, well, what's, you know, what's out in the world? What do we like? Mm -hmm. And so we got to live in um, some of the places that we thought we might like, like Paris and London. We weren't crazy about them. We went to some places that we thought we would hate. Right. Like we were both worried about going to Thailand because we're both like, kind of like fastidious. We don't like dirt, you know, mm -hmm. kind of. And we got to Thailand thinking like, oh God, we're going to be miserable here. There's going to be dirt and bugs. And right. we loved it. It was one of our favorite places in the world. So we learned a lot about ourselves and, and kind of what made us happy and didn't. Mm -hmm. um, and then for work, uh, Marissa wanted to make a career move. And so she came down here to be a, a UX researcher mm -hmm. at a, a startup in Austin. Nice. Um, and since I was going to be in Austin anyways, that kind of landed me here because mm -hmm. of uh, Robin Cannon, who hooked me up with the job. That guy, Robin. <laughs> <laughs> he's good people. I know, he's good people. I want to talk to him next. <laughs> so one thing I want to touch on uh, that was interesting, like management's not within my skill set, right? Mm -hmm. um, you came in here and I've seen you work, uh, not necessarily as a manager, but kind of like a, a lead, if that title's right, or more like a mentor. Like, I, So yeah. this is actually, so I think this is such an important distinction. I mm -hmm. think there's a huge, huge difference between leadership yeah. and management. Yeah. Because leadership is like, I'm a great leader because I will stake my job on something that I think is right. Mm -hmm. I believe in it all the way, like to the core of my soul. I believe that what I'm doing is mm -hmm. the thing that should be done. Right. And I want people to come with me. Um, and I, I think that people sense that and they, they are, you know, we're attracted to people who believe things. Mm -hmm. Like you, you want to follow somebody who's doing that. Right. However, after you follow me, I don't, I don't have that internal barometer that says, oh, I should check in. Mm -hmm. and see how they're doing. Mm -hmm. Or like, it, we've got deadlines, I should make sure that everybody's on track, mm -hmm. or I need to make sure that you've got everything you need. I kind of just, like, I see a goal and I start going, mm -hmm. and I just assume you're gonna solve all the problems. Right. Or the you're still right next to me doing what I think you're doing, kind of thing. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Yeah. And so, so I think that every good leader mm -hmm need somebody who's a great manager, mm -hmm. um, which is another reason why I came here, because I needed somebody like Robin, who yeah. is a great manager, mm -hmm. um, and he's going to have much better insight into how to do that than I ever will. Mm -hmm. But, um, you know, he has that ability to sit with everybody and figure out what they're feeling good about, what they're feeling bad about, find out how to, like, clear away the bad stuff and mm -hmm. make room for them to do their best work. Those are all things that... I know how to do it for myself, but I do it by instinct. Right. And I, I, I could not explain to you how I walk into a room and, mm -hmm. and like advocate for what I want mm -hmm. because it's just, it's like a, and it just comes out. Mm -hmm. Like I see the thing that should happen and I will argue with you because mm -hmm. I think it should happen. Mm -hmm. But I couldn't explain to you how to right. have that same argument. Yeah, I mean, if we had an argument, I wouldn't have known it because I, think <laughs> I, I jumped into things and I think the one time we worked together was on this something around this page and how it's done and there's probably some design issues mm -hmm. um, but you wanted to I think you focused it on something like well here's the thing I want to fix mm -hmm. how can you help me fix yeah. that and that's something I was trying to internalize in every conversation I have I think there are people that I work with um, in like we're talking in the context of a bigger company <laughs> right right who I think look at it in a very here's my feet them right I need to protect my feet them mm -hmm. right versus like Here's my, whatever the opposite of that, I need to bring in as many allies as possible. Or not even look at it that way, or like, I just need to help you. Right? Yeah, I think, you know, one of the things that, that bothers me about big companies mm -hmm. is, is the way that they prioritize things is that they, they'll start with a list of problems. Mm -hmm. They say, this, you know, this doesn't work, or customers are frustrated by this, and that's a good thing to do. Mm -hmm. You should start with that list. But then they have workshops, and out of those workshops, they come out with targets. Right. And so they'll say... Our customer has this problem, we workshopped it, and now we're working on, like, solution X. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And so solution X then becomes the target. Mm -hmm. And everybody in the company only ever hears about the target. Right. So then as we work on it, um, as is, you know, common, yeah. as you work through the problem, you see the, the doors and corners that you weren't paying attention to, and there's a caveat, there's a mm -hmm. problem. Mm -hmm. That problem then prevents you from solving the original customer issue, mm -hmm. But we all forgot about the original customer issue because we're focused on the target. Mm -hmm. And so I would love to see more management done where when they prioritize, 
they prioritize by leading with the problem. Right. We want to make it easier for our users to do this. Mm -hmm. Current proposal, do it like this. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But this is what stays intact always. Right. And whenever we find a problem, we hit that door or corner, mm -hmm. and it says this thing doesn't work, then we look back and we go, oh, well, that doesn't really solve the problem anymore, mm -hmm. does it? Mm -hmm. Well, we, should, we better rethink this. Right. As opposed to just shipping something because we committed to shipping something. Who, who do you think, um, whether you've worked with them directly or not, does that well or seems to do that well? Um, I mean, I would say that like the companies that have done it particularly well are like Apple in its golden day, mm -hmm. and and honestly, you would you could even argue that they weren't they were solving problems that they knew about that their customers didn't know they had, mm -hmm. um, which is uh, you know, I don't know how. whether or not that's something that's reproducible, yeah. uh, or it was just like a right place, right time, right vision kind Some of thing. Some kind of Zen meditation, climbing mountain, <laughs> Fasting. <laughs> right? Yeah, some some kind of magic in yeah. there, but you know, you're seeing it in in companies that are delivering, like a lot of the companies on Kickstarter. Yeah, they're they're not pitching you a gadget; mm -hmm. they're pitching you a solution. Mm -hmm. um, and it it kind of like it's like an infomercial without the cheesiness. Yeah. you know, like where it, they're starting with like, oh, it sucks when I have to like. Here's a good example. I just bought a shelf, mm -hmm. right? It's uh, from a company called Artifox. Mm -hmm. And the the shelves are built to be magnetic and rearrangeable, and they are whiteboard erasable. Okay. And they are like really easy to install. Mm -hmm. Like you just need a, a drill, and that's mm -hmm. all. Mm -hmm. And so that shelf solves multiple problems for me. Yeah. The you know I can't find something that has exactly all the pieces I need because I keep my sunglasses in a case. I don't hang them on a shelf, right? Mm -hmm. So a shelf with a sunglass sunglass hanger. It's not relevant to me. Mm -hmm. um, or like, uh, you know, I want to hang one set of keys, not 12. Mm -hmm. So the shelf that I found that's got 12 hooks on it, mm -hmm. like, what am I going to do with the other 11 hooks? Right. <laughs> um, so, you know, it, what they did was they made it like, they saw the problem mm -hmm. that people do need a shelf. Yeah. And they all have similar needs, but they made it configurable. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so you kind of like buy these different building blocks. Like right. I bought a box of magnets. Mm -hmm. and those magnets are pegs that I can hang something off of right. or use as a base for a shelf mm -hmm. or, or whatever. And I can get a, a dry erase marker and like write notes on it instead of having to buy a shelf and a dry erase yeah. board. Yeah. Just little shit like that mm -hmm. where they, they thought through how people would use something. Yeah. And I'm sure that they had a list of like the customer needs to be able to. Mm -hmm. And they just went down that list mm -hmm. and solved those problems. Mm -hmm. And I love how they also they backed it up enough so you're not going down to that snowflake. Mm -hmm. But you're giving them maybe that mile for them to be creative with the tools they gave them. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And it, it, they, they balanced like mm -hmm. do it yourself mm -hmm. with a ready-made solution. Yeah. Like, I can rearrange that shelf, mm -hmm. but it's not like an Ikea shelf where yeah. I'm putting the whole thing together. I've destroyed some Or, like, one of those ones... <laughs> 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 or, like, those ones yeah. that you would buy at a, at a Home Depot that are, like, to build your home shop. Yeah. And it's completely configurable, mm -hmm. and, like, out of the box, it does nothing. Right. You're like, oh, my God, this is just a bunch of wire racks. <laughs> right. and it's like my products it. for the next month. Yeah, yeah right? Yeah. So they, they found a good level of, like, we, we will give you enough to do mm -hmm. that you control it, but not so much that it's hard. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm seeing a lot of products come on that, that are solving that problem. Right. Um, we kind of got off topic here. No, that's fine. Keep going. <laughs> Keep going. But I, like, there's a, another company that I forget the name mm -hmm. of, but they have a desk that's exactly the same concept. It's, yeah. uh, it's modular, mm -hmm. and you get the pieces that you need. Oh, I have an iPhone, so here's an iPhone dock that like slots in, or you can get the plant carrier, or you can get the laptop holder, or you know all these mm -hmm. different pieces. But you only get the pieces you need. You don't get like you know, this giant desk with lots of built-ins mm -hmm. that's, it's only configured to one use case. Right, right. I, I'm just going back, as, when I was a kid, I had like a fish tank, mm -hmm. and then you had the basic fish tank, but as you understood and grew it more, you know, you got the whatever for the guppies. Or the oh, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> they all died in the end, but it's like <laughs> the little pieces that made you what you wanted that fish tank to be right, over right. time, right? Um, the, the, I'm trying to think of the topic I wanted to get to, but I love your ideas on like how do you get to basically that golden whatever it is. Mm -hmm. So people are balanced, you're making money, the company looks good, the customers love you. Um, but I would like to, to kind of switch a little bit because I think something really interesting was um, how you did the remote work or how you feel that mm. fits in with your life. Um, I just interviewed a guy who left here recently and he's doing that now, John Chalice. And he had um, traveled a lot of Asia, spent some time in India. Mm -hmm. um, I think he's doing South America now. So oh, good for him. 
I know, I know. Okay, internet. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, <laughs> it, anything in particular about the real um, world? Or? It's a lot of, I think, what I've seen in your, your business, at least from your homepage, is like, um, this helped me, right? Yeah. This is how I can maybe help you. Yeah. Right. And so, yeah, so a lot of my um, personal writing has been centered around this idea of um, remote work builds better teams. Mm -hmm. um, and I think the, the reasoning behind that is that it forces everybody to be more honest about what's being done. Mm -hmm. um, if I come into the office here and I walk in a circle all day, I'm very visible, I'm talking to people, mm -hmm. Everyone will assume that I'm productive, mm -hmm. but I might not turn in any work at all. Um, and at a company the size of IBM, depending on how good your management chain is, you could do that for years, you know? Years, eh? Um, <laughs> and and it, now that's not to say that like you can't have good mm -hmm. co-located companies. Yeah. Obviously, if you're a small company, mm -hmm. five, ten people, you're going to notice if right. somebody's not pulling their weight. Mm -hmm. um, what I like about remote work though is that it puts the the onus on management mm -hmm. to define what they want yeah because I can't measure you as a remote worker unless I know what I'm measuring mm -hmm. so I need to be able to give you clear goals and clear deliverables mm -hmm. or else uh, what am I gonna say yeah. well you you're not performing at this thing I haven't yeah, said. yeah. exactly yeah. right and mm -hmm. and so the argument I would make an argument that you should be doing that in, in co-located businesses as well. Yeah. Um, it just gets easier when you're mm -hmm. remote because you're you're setting a list of targets. We need to. We've got a list of fifty things that we need done mm -hmm. uh, today. I want you to get one and two done. Mm -hmm. And if you get one and two done, I don't care if it takes you two hours right. or twenty. Mm -hmm. you, this is what you've committed to, and I expect you to finish it. Mm -hmm. um, and that gives you the opportunity. Like I said, I worked for that PN. Right? Yeah. Uh, when I was working for Precision Nutrition. My contract was, it was a full-time contract, mm -hmm. but it was on deliverables. So my metrics were, you're going to meet these targets. Mm -hmm. Once I met those targets, the, I had a couple periods where I had a week and a half where I'd hit my targets, mm -hmm. and the next meeting to set the next set of targets, it wasn't, you know, it was, I had 10 days. So I just did whatever I wanted. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and the, the, company, <laughs> they, the company yeah. never complained. Yeah. The company was never upset. They mm -hmm. never said, well, what did you do with your time? Because they told me what they wanted, right. and I did it. We just agree we, add, we would then uh, estimate a little more aggressively next time around mm -hmm. so that I didn't have a week and a half yeah, vital time. time. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, because obviously, like, mm -hmm. when you're in a company, you want to maximize the, the utility. Because you're getting for full time. Right. right. Yeah. right? Yeah. So I should be doing 40 hours of work, mm -hmm. but not more, mm -hmm. and not significantly less. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. But the other thing about remote work and the reason that I think it's so important is that, you know, if you, if you look at the research around people's efficiency, mm -hmm. in an office setting, especially open office settings, which are really popular right now, your daily productivity is going to be like 30%. Mm -hmm. You'll get maybe, maybe, maybe three hours of work done mm -hmm. if you're really, really focused. Mm -hmm. And when you work at home, you'll get six hours of work mm -hmm. done. And so you, your ability to produce just goes way up. Mm -hmm. The likelihood of having silly meetings where you're just kind of like, oh, let's hop in a room and talk about something, that that drops down because it's inconvenient right. to set up the WebEx. And, to do drive-bys and then, yeah. Yeah, you yeah. know, like that's yeah. that stuff gets harder, so people are more deliberate about their communication, mm -hmm. um, which is a double-edged sword because right. if, if people stop communicating, the team falls apart. Mm -hmm. So you do have to make a deliberate effort to talk to the team, do team building, mm -hmm. things like that. Mm -hmm. um, but... To point to another good example yeah. of Precision Nutrition, their their team is maybe 70, yeah. and they're fully remote. Uh, nobody has an office. And what they do instead of paying for office space is they put that money in a bucket, mm -hmm. and a couple times a year, they just take everybody in the company, fly them out to Toronto, and put them up in a five-star hotel. Lovely. So you get to go stay at the Four mm -hmm. Seasons, and ultimately, it probably costs PN less than half of what they would spend on office space mm -hmm. to put their company through like a spa-like right. on-site. You're reinvigorated, you meet people. Like, I think Automatic does that. You do like yeah. um, the once a year full everybody, whatever right. that's called. And then I think once a quarter, not that I've studied this, <laughs> <laughs> once a quarter the team meets up somewhere. Right, so yeah, I, and, yeah, and I think, you know, like quarterly is good or, or even like, if it's a small team and it's not too far for everybody to travel, yeah. like monthly, get mm -hmm. together, 
have a couple days, like sit down and, and come up with your plan, mm -hmm. um, and then roll. You know, but you can do a video stand up with your team every day. Yeah, and like five minutes, you can get online and make sure that you're all in alignment on mm -hmm. what you want to do. And then you've got Slack, you've got email, mm -hmm. you've got all these tools that allow you to get unblocked asynchronously. Mm -hmm. um, being remote helps with that asynchronous working. Right. When I was working in Thailand, it was the most efficient I've ever been because I would have to take one call a day because it was the only time that we were all awake. Mm -hmm. And that one call was, here's all the stuff I did yesterday and all the stuff I will need for tomorrow. Mm -hmm. And they would say, okay, great. Mm -hmm. We have a list of things that we need to get you. We will get you those. And here's a list of things that we expect from you tomorrow. Nice. And then, I, so I would get my to-do list and a list of promised ideas. Mm -hmm. And then the, far, the following morning, mm -hmm. I would wake up and they would have delivered to me all of the things that I needed yeah. so that I could then move forward. I love that. I, I had that uh, when I was working with um, a team in India. I had to kind of figure that out. There's no wasted meetings. Mm -hmm. Like I had to have it all planned out. They were QA people and I was like, these are the things that we need done before right. the next time we talk. Otherwise, like, I'm, I, I just killed two days. Right. You know? Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. And, mm -hmm. and after we had like one or two meetings where we just didn't get it right and right. we ended up burning those two days, mm -hmm. we never did it again. Yeah. We were so efficient after that. And mm -hmm. these are people who like, these are definitely shoulder tappy people. Like the kind of people who would just shoot you a quick slack and be yeah. like, hey, what's up? Because mm -hmm. when I was on US time, right. uh, I was working for PN mm -hmm. and they, they are very like, Let's, let's hash it out, let's mm -hmm. talk through it, let's, you know, let's not worry about the details. We wasted 48 hours a couple times and they were like, okay, okay. We, can be, <laughs> we can be focused here. And it was great, like right. it, was, it was really wonderful because right. it, it just, it shows that even a team that you might think isn't capable of doing it, yeah. with a little bit of conditioning, and in my case I just removed the variables, there was no option, we got it right or we'd lost the time. Mm -hmm. um, but with that constraint, mm -hmm. they stepped up and they right. killed it. Nice. Um, and, and I think that everyone on that team was more effective than I've ever seen yeah. simply because of those constraints. Mm -hmm. And so I think that remote work is a great way of adding those constraints mm -hmm. to force you to be the best version of yourself. Mm -hmm. Do you, I'm sure you've heard a lot of the cons and why people say I don't want to do it. Like what are, how have you addressed some of those? I, some people just don't like it, man. Like I, like, Everyone has their their sweet spot. Mm -hmm. For me, I think that my sweet spot is about 80-20. Mm -hmm. I want to be remote about 80% of the time. Right. And I, I want to work solo. I want to have a list of tasks that I'm just that I'm tackling. Mm -hmm. um, and twenty percent of the time I want to be in the office and I want to accomplish very little. Mm -hmm. I just want to like kick ideas around. I want to talk to people, do the team building. Mm -hmm. Some people are more in like the 50-50, some people are like 80% social. Mm -hmm. Um and for some roles that makes sense. Like if right. you're a, a product manager or a project manager, yeah, your job should be socializing mm -hmm. your product. Mm -hmm. um, if you're a developer, it might make less sense to be 80% social yeah. because you're not going to get a lot done. But, um, <laughs> yeah. but you know, it, it, it does depend on your personality mm -hmm. type. Right. I also know people who are developers who just can't code mm -hmm. unless they're in a room full of people coding. Wow. Um, it's and not like not like they they're incapable of doing right. it, but they just focus better when the people around them are also focused. Mm -hmm. They're and like little dogs; they need to be around people. <laughs> like my dog yeah. won't do anything unless he's like some home. Like, exactly. Yeah. Right. And yeah. so it's it's just the way that you where you feel comfortable mm -hmm. in your mm -hmm. profession. Yeah. Um, if you know, like I've got a good friend who, when he's at home and he's trying to work, he will do everything in his power mm -hmm. to distract himself. Right. Um, I, that's not something that I struggle with, mm -hmm. but so he had to put all this crazy shit in place. Like, he's got a timer set where he only gets access to Facebook mm -hmm. for like forty-five minutes a day, mm -hmm. and so he counts down the minutes <laughs> until Facebook becomes available so that he can like get his fix. I love <laughs> to study that person, <laughs> <laughs> especially around habits. That's such an interesting. Case, yeah, but know. so he had to just short he had yeah. to short circuit all of his habits to mm -hmm. do it. Um, he calls it nuclear mode. Nice. And he just like he he eliminates his ability to do anything but yeah. work because he he is a office worker, mm -hmm. but he wants to be a remote worker. Ooh, ooh, okay, okay, that's a good thing. So there is like what your awareness of yourself would be, right? Mm -hmm. um, for that person or people are thinking about it, what are some things that you kind of figure out with them or they would need to know up front? I mean, you, a lot of it's going to come down to experimentation mm -hmm. um, because every, every single person, no matter what level of, of uh, experience they have or mm -hmm. what level of introversion or extroversion or self-starting, 
everyone's got their sweet spots and they're completely different. Mm -hmm. um, you know, for me, I'm, I'm most effective when I'm in an environment that is um, a little bit noisy mm -hmm. and where I can just kind of sit for a few hours and have access to coffee. Yeah. Um, so I'm great in a coffee shop, mm -hmm. but my partner, she can't do a coffee shop. There's mm -hmm. too much visual stimulus. Mm -hmm. And so she can totally focus if she's in a coffee shop facing the corner. Um, and, and we yeah. just learn that about yeah. her. Like, mm -hmm. she has to sit facing away from the restaurant. Some people movement colors, right? Because if yeah. there's people moving, she's mm -hmm. going to people watch. She's going to think about what that couple's talking about. She's going to watch her make the coffee. She, oh, well, you know, right. all that. I, I don't do that. Mm -hmm. So, like, I can sit and look, like out at the, the entirety of existence, and mm -hmm. if I'm focused on a problem, mm -hmm. it all kind of like tunnels down for me to what I'm working on. Mm -hmm. and, and so that's just a thing that I know about myself. Wow. Mm -hmm. So we, we think about that when we choose where to sit in a restaurant. Nice. Like I have to put headphones in because if I don't have headphones in, she will want to talk. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. She has to put headphones in because if she doesn't put headphones in, she'll eavesdrop on whoever's behind her. And like there's, it, that's right. just stuff that you the gotta... self-awareness thing you have mm -hmm. to start with and then mm -hmm. the experimenting around that. Yeah, I, I feel that like my wife and I are the same way. Her thing around coffee shops is like optimal seating, mm. uh, meaning like not too hard on the butt. Yes. Mine, <laughs> mine is like, where's the internet? Where's the power? Where's the coffee? Where's the bathroom? Right. You know, can I have easy access to all of them? Well, yeah. And like, you am know? I, am I going to be able to get up and go use this bathroom mm -hmm. without having to pack down all my gear? Exactly. That's the, that one's always hard for me. Mm -hmm. Cause like I, I was fortunate because when I travel with Marissa, you got one of us can watch yeah. we're on the buddy system. Mm -hmm. If you're traveling solo, that becomes a whole different ballpark right. because right. like, in Tokyo, oh yeah, like in Tokyo, yeah. you can leave your computer on a table and walk You away. can leave it's a totally lot of cash there. They don't but <laughs> in Thailand, yeah. you don't even want to let it out of your sight necessarily, mm -hmm. depending on where you are. Right. Just because it's you know the culture there, like yeah. unattended things become other people's things. <laughs> yeah, yeah. We, we found out we were experimenting in Mexico, and um, we lost all of. We had our computers. But they stole our, um, they, uh, we allowed people to steal <laughs> right, our cables. Mm. So I was in Mexico without like a MacBook um, plug. And I was like, oh shit. Yeah. And how do you replace that? And, mm -hmm. that stuff. and I was like, then they kind of woke me up. I was like, okay, now I know where I'm at. How do I behave? That kind of thing. It's, exactly. Yeah. You just, and you just got to know, like, do I, would it be easier for me to work out of my hotel room mm -hmm. because I can, I can keep my stuff here? Yeah. Or like, do I want to go work? Mm -hmm until lunch and just make sure I use the bathroom first. Mm -hmm. um, you know, like that, like, but you kind of got to think about it in yeah. that terms, which wasn't something I'd ever really done before. Mm -hmm. Cause you know, I lived in Portland and the right. coffee shops that I was in in Portland, I knew the people who worked there. Mm -hmm. So when I got up to use the bathroom, I just make eye contact with right. them and they would watch. Mm -hmm. uh, that's not really an option when you're, when you're somewhere that you don't speak the language, you don't yeah. know anybody. Yeah. Cause you don't know the culture. You might be like, Hey, can you watch my stuff? And they'd be like, this is mine now. <laughs> my stuff? <laughs> I, yeah, I, I've been in places, in Austin, people ask me more for some reason, maybe it's the Austin thing. Can you, complete stranger, can you watch my computer? I'm like, yes. <laughs> right. they, did a, they, did yeah. a, um, they did an experiment on yeah. that, like a psychology experiment, mm -hmm. and it turns out that asking a stranger to watch your stuff mm -hmm. makes them like three times more likely to defend it. Really? Yeah. Wow. Super weird, but that it's like a social contract. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, complete stranger, you pointed out that person, something yeah. like, something But you, you yeah. assigned responsibility. Right. It's kind of like if you, if you get hurt yeah. and you need somebody to call 911, you shouldn't say someone call 911, you should Jason, say point. you call 911. Jason, call 911. Exactly. You're like, okay. Yeah, <laughs> right? like you're, you're assigning, you can't let somebody say somebody else will get it. Right, right. Um, so you're, it's, it's an interesting little... Yeah, that extra leap of um, taking action, I think, is hard for people to do. Right, right, right. Yeah, so it's you, um, again, it's like shaping the environment. Like, right. uh, for, for yourself, you mm -hmm. can figure out what works, and if you need somebody else to do something, mm -hmm. and you got to make the right thing the easy thing, yeah. right? Like, yeah. the, the, the easy thing in most cases right. is an inertia. And so if, yeah. you make the, if you make the inertia the hard thing, mm -hmm. you've basically smoothed the path. They're going to do the right thing by default now because that's where what inertia would up. take them. Yeah, yeah, I like, I'm going to steal that line. Because we had an incident, and I, I guess a... Uh, where someone said, how come no one stepped up? And I kind of quoted the thing, like if you yell out help into a park, no one's gonna ask for help. But I think that, that line you said, just make an inertia the hard thing. Make the right thing the easy thing. This make is, the right thing the easy thing. Like, yeah. This has been my mantra mm -hmm. um, for, for my entire professional mm -hmm. career, mm -hmm. is it doesn't matter how good the thing you build is. Right. It matters if people are willing to use it and they won't be willing to use it mm -hmm. unless you make it the easiest thing. Right. Like by default, it needs to be the, the easiest, easiest thing. thing. 
Oh, no, that's, that's a good nugget. Where's your book? <laughs> <laughs> Where's your, I don't know if I've got another book in where, me, man. Really? Like, oh. really? <laughs> <laughs> People are like, hey, man, you should write a book. It's like, ooh, that's a tough one. <laughs> that's a tough if, you, one. if you do it, yeah. write it in public as a blog and then compile the blog okay. into a book. That's, what I, a blog that's right what I did now. with the travel okay. book okay. and it was much more palatable because when I wrote uh, my tech books, mm -hmm. it was a nightmare. Because it's it like, like start from zero. Right. You're on the hook to write 400 pages of content yeah. and like there's a whole editing process mm -hmm. and like it does none of the content gets to breathe. You don't get to see yeah. where people take it. Mm -hmm. uh, so you're just like, uh, I hope that this... Right. Thousands and thousands and thousands of words land probably right. working on your masterpiece in your basement sort of thing exactly yeah. Yeah. yeah, but if you do it in a blog you get to like test each idea mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Kind of, uh, Yeah, I've been doing that for about a year now with my blog and um, that's why these videos have come up I mean, any video I've done. It's just like the reaction has been really yeah, really good. So yeah. um, I, I know I'm trying to think if you have any commitments today, but I don't want to take too much of your time. I, uh, <laughs> right? No, I, I don't. I don't have any crazy commitments. All right, so I'll talk all day. No, um, <laughs> <laughs> I, one thing that um, that goes along, I think, with writing, with your business, with with uh, what you're doing, is your speaking. Mm -hmm. I think that's a, it. Seems to be a big part of your life. Can you? Mm -hmm. What? How is that? important to you or I'm trying to get a better question. What's my question? <laughs> I, I mean, uh, so like, I, I'll answer the question, why bother? Okay, uh, yes. Thank you. And, and so I, I believe that public speaking and, and just teaching in general mm -hmm. is the best way to make sure you really know something. Mm -hmm. And I, when I'm saying that I believe you need to make the right thing the easy thing, Doing that requires you to think from a beginner's perspective mm. and having that conversation with a beginner and saying like, here's a concept. I want to introduce you to this concept. Mm. The questions you get at the end, the discussions you have after the fact, the frustrations that somebody will share with you from the audience, those are the types of things that help you make the right thing the easy thing because mm -hmm. they're going to tell you all the all the excuses they're going to give you when you tell them you need to do it. Right. That is very forthcoming. They're mm -hmm. going to say... You know, I tried it, it didn't work because of this. Or they told us that we had to do this, it didn't work because of this. Mm -hmm. And in having those conversations, you can then say, all right, well, I now preemptively, mm -hmm. I can design around this problem. I can come up with a, a, a like automated solution mm -hmm. to that problem and make it so that when you say, well, what about this? I'll be like, I got you. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> like, yeah, but what about this? Yeah, I got you there too. Mm -hmm. Don't worry. Mm -hmm. um, and, and in that process, you build that skill set through public speaking. Nice. Um, the other thing too is just like, I don't have kids. I don't intend to have kids. Mm -hmm. And I feel like there's something, like the reason that I would have kids mm -hmm. is for the, the outside hope that I can ultimately create a, a human or small set of humans who are capable of like taking all of the good things that I have mm -hmm. And more, mm -hmm. and you know, ultimately, like rising up and, and overcoming and destroying me, right? Like right. you wanna you wanna create that next better generation. Mm -hmm. Because I'm not going to have children, right. the closest I can get is to try to teach, mm -hmm. um, and I I want to do that at whatever scale I can. Yeah. And I don't feel like I've got a lot to teach in the you know how to balance your checkbook <laughs> area, right? But I can right. teach people how to improve their careers. Mm -hmm how to uh, become more effective as developers or mm -hmm. how to how to use some tool to help like sell an idea at their company to help them become more prominent. Mm -hmm. Those are the things that I've been able to do for myself. Mm -hmm. And so trying to speak about that in a way that would allow someone else to hopefully take some of that information and apply it to themselves and, and see similar gains. Right. That to me is like the when people talk about legacy, like my children are my legacy. Mm -hmm me teaching this stuff is the closest I'm going to get to a legacy. Mm. And hopefully someday I'll be remembered and, and right. on one of these inspirational walls mm -hmm. in a place like mm -hmm. IBM, they'll just have like make the right thing the easy thing attributed, attributed to me and I'll right. be like, I did it. Yeah, because you're, <laughs> you're in your hospital bed or whatever, like, Jason, look what I found. <laughs> I did it. <laughs> exactly. Right. Exactly. Right. I like that. Yeah, it's... You, you did some things, I, I think, for the designers and developers here, of like, let's start looking at conferences. Mm -hmm. um, what, what was the thing you hoped to get out of that, that activity? I mean, I, I think that easily the best thing that ever happened in my career was becoming a public speaker. Mm -hmm. Because 
when I started speaking, people started assuming that I was smart, yes. which put me under pressure to live up to those expectations. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I, I promised some conference that I could speak about something with authority. Right. They gave me the authority of their platform, and then people arrived into that session That's assuming spending. they were going to come out with high quality information. Yeah. So I had to make sure that I, I went back and I learned the thing that I was going to talk about really well. And I already knew it beforehand. It's not like I'm just come pulling things out of my ass. But, mm -hmm. you know, I, I had to come in and, and really back it up. I'm like, right. okay, I, you know, I read this back. I looked at this. I'm sure. Mm -hmm. I'm sure that this is right. Mm -hmm. And the stuff that I talk about in my keynotes, like the work-life balance and yeah. stuff, those are just, that's just stories. This is the stuff I do every day. Mm -hmm. um, but when I started giving these talks and when I started presenting this information to people, I, I noticed that companies started to think that I was more valuable. Mm -hmm. um, when I applied to IBM, I have a similar level of experience to a lot of developers in IBM, right. but because I've written three books and mm -hmm. because I've been a keynote speaker on you know, various different mm -hmm. web design conferences, they see me as being a higher value acquisition. Mm -hmm. And I don't think that there's any magic to that. It's not because of me or what mm -hmm. I've accomplished. It's because I was publicly visible. Mm -hmm. And we tend to value things that we're familiar with higher. It's brand recognition, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. So I created a little bit of a brand in the web development community. Right. People saw my name on mm -hmm. smashingmagazine.com or CSS Tricks or, or whatever. Mm -hmm. And then later, I apply for a job and you go, hey, wait, I saw you at the mm -hmm. GraphQL Summit. Mm -hmm. You must be really good at this. Mm -hmm. And they nev they'll never verify. They'll never right. check facts. Right. So it's on me to live up to that mm -hmm. expectation, yeah. of course. Something around familiarity and comfort, right. seeing you, okay, right. I get it, okay. And it, it just it, it puts right. you in that position where like now, it's not like me putting my resume mm -hmm. in an anonymous stack of resumes. Right. It's me being able to come in the door and say, hi, you may have heard of me before. Mm -hmm. I am interested in working here. Mm -hmm. And now it's like a, a conversation on level playing field. Yeah. I think you can offer me something and you've seen what I can offer. Mm -hmm. As opposed to you being like, all right, well, what's in it for me? Exactly. What, why do I have to spend this time on you now? Exactly. And maybe give you some money. Right. right. And it, it puts yeah. you in a better position to negotiate mm -hmm. too because if you're, if you're visible, that means that your prospects are high. Yeah. Um, if I leave, you know, if I leave IBM, I've got four companies that are willing to take me right now. And if I leave one of those companies, there are four others that mm -hmm. are willing to take me. And, and none of those jobs might be the right job for right. me. Um, they, they all might be something that I don't ultimately want to do. Mm -hmm. But it means that I will, I'll never, for the, the next probably five, ten years at least, I will never have to worry that I can't find a job. Right. I would only have to worry about whether or not I can find a job that's a good fit for mm -hmm. me. Mm -hmm. And that's a huge amount of pressure off my shoulders. Yeah, yeah. I remember starting out, a lot of the people that I've talked to through the blog and through these videos are just past the first starting out. They're in their first year or their first job. Mm -hmm. And I told them, like, that's going to be your hardest job interview. Like, you, it's a little bit easier now. Yes. And then now your next step is to kind of get past the, oh, I need to apply. Oh, I need to update my portfolio. Mm -hmm. There's more than that, right? Mm -hmm. um, and the last question... I have a selfish question because I've been doing talks um, okay. and I've gotten to where I think I have a formula. Um, one where like, okay, here's a, here's a title, here's within the topic I think that would make sense within this conference. And of the numbers game, I get, I'm batting somewhere around uh, a one and one. Like one acceptance and one rejection, <laughs> right? But I, I think the next level is a keynote, right? Mm. And I don't fully understand that level yet. Why so, would someone give me a keynote? So. Yeah. Keynotes, mm. typically speaking, are going to be more abstract. Mm -hmm. So they they want um, for a keynote something that somebody learns how to think about a problem versus how to solve a particular problem. Okay. Um, so like with a with a typical talk, you're going to follow a formula that's kind of like you know oh here's a pain, mm -hmm. let me poke it, mm -hmm. let me give you a peek through the window at something that's much better, mm -hmm. and then I'll like set you out on the path. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. Whereas something something in a keynote realm is going to be more like, as an industry, mm -hmm. we're suffering from this. Mm -hmm. In the coming days, you know, in the, the weeks, months, years, whatever, we're going to hit a crossroads, mm -hmm. and that crossroads is going to require us to adjust the way that we function. Right. And here are some ideas mm -hmm. about what that might look like. So it becomes almost a, a more of a thought exercise or a right. philosophical kind of thing mm -hmm. versus a, like, here's a practical solution for right now. Mm -hmm. um, and some of the best ones that I've seen are, like, what are the ethical implications of, of building the stuff that we build? Right. Or 
or how do we overcome the fear mm-hmm. of rejection or the fear of, uh, of like getting it wrong? Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. Things on imposter syndrome, things mm-hmm. on like the future of tech. One of the one of the right. more enjoyable ones that I saw was somebody just straight up giving hypotheticals. Mm-hmm. You know, what if in the future we find out that it's like this. Mm-hmm. And then they just rattled on some ideas about like, well, we'd have to think about this mm-hmm. and about this and about this. And it was kind of just like seeing the way that somebody at a high level right. thinks about these types of problems mm-hmm. and how they spin out the future. Mm-hmm. Um, and it, it gives you the ability to think more laterally about what somebody's doing, mm-hmm. right? So I, I think that your most valuable skill as a human is your ability to think laterally. Mm-hmm. Um, what you know as a designer, what I know as a developer, Underneath the hood, probably about 75% the same. Mm-hmm. Like, really all that changes is the tactic that we have for getting the problem solved. Right. So, how can we apply those same skills to urban planning, mm-hmm. to writing, to uh, team building? Mm-hmm. Like, we have the requisite skills, but we don't think about how they apply somewhere else. So, I, I think that, that, for me, a keynote should a keynote should take something that you think you know really well, and it should show you like crack the door and show you what the adjacent possible is. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. You, have you ever heard that term, the adjacent possible? No, it's all new. So the, the adjacent possible is a concept that uh, I think is, is kind of like used in the, the realm of invention, okay. where it's not possible today to invent a light speed drive. Mm-hmm. The same way that it wasn't possible in the 1800s to develop a jet engine. Mm-hmm. That's super easy for us now because we have all the technology. Mm-hmm. But in order to get to a jet engine, Mm -hmm. first, somebody needed to invent, uh, like, uh, a way to to make wings. A different fuel. Or, like, wings that can support the weight Mm -hmm. of of something like that. Or, you know, all these things. And then before all of that, we needed the Wright brothers to invent, like, flight. flight. Um, And so, like, when the Wright brothers Mm -hmm. invented flight, the adjacent possible became Mm -hmm. passenger planes or, like, Mm -hmm cargo planes or suddenly it was like hey we could build a business out of transporting things mm-hmm. by air but until they invented that it right. wasn't part of the adjacent possible okay. and so one of the things that I think is really cool about uh, keynotes mm-hmm. is that you have the opportunity to say like let me think a step ahead here mm-hmm. what's possible now that mm-hmm. wasn't possible previously okay what have we invented in the last few years that we can now apply mm-hmm. to doing something really cool mm-hmm. and if you leave your audience and they're, they're thinking like Man, there's more. There's more out there than I thought. Mm-hmm. That's a fucking great keynote. Yeah, yeah. So I'm taking it back, maybe to some things you said earlier in our conversation. It's like Apple at one time, and it's Zenith. If we're assuming it's not anymore, <laughs> right? you know, right? I assume so because my iPhone died. But like, <laughs> <laughs> bastards, nine hundred dollars. Um, the uh, if you get them to think beyond, this is the problem I see right now. Mm-hmm. To like a few steps further. Right, and, you know, into a direction that no one's really thinking about. And mm-hmm. I feel that there, there needs to be, for me, a step up in how I'm thinking, how I'm talking, what I'm writing about. Um, I think I'm at a level where I can kind of solve certain problems or get people to solve them for me. But um, to kind of think, get to that level, almost. Um, yeah. yeah. And, and all it really takes is, mm-hmm. is, like, think about the problems that you, like, what are the pains that you have, mm-hmm. right? And then what what could we do to solve it? Like, um Marissa, my partner, is is currently thinking she spends her job, she's the head of research at a company called Clearhead, which is an Accenture research company. Mm-hmm. Um, she's the, the head of research there, and she spends her job right now figuring out how to sell more shoes or mm-hmm. how to get more click-throughs on a certain page, mm-hmm. right? And so she enjoys the job because it's challenging work, yeah. but she's wondering, like, well, what else does this apply to? Mm-hmm. So she's starting to look at things like urban planning. How can you use this user research stuff that we're doing, these, these different types mm-hmm. of split testing and this way of gathering data to design um, parking structures mm-hmm. that are more pleasant or like walkable cities or ways to control um, you know, foot traffic, bike traffic, yeah. to decrease road noise or, or safety, you know, stuff like that. Mm-hmm. That's not really like revolutionary thinking, mm-hmm. but it's something that a lot of people aren't considering that you already have the skill for. Right. You know, the stuff that you're doing today would absolutely apply to the real world. Mm-hmm. We just don't think about that mm-hmm. because we're, we we came up digital, right. we work digital, mm-hmm. and so we we stay digital. Mm-hmm. But you just step a little bit to the left and it's mm-hmm. like, oh shit, I could do this 
Mm -hmm. I can do this in a lot mm -hmm. of places. Yeah, yeah. I met a researcher, a former coworker recently. Um, she was at an agency. We were together, and then she moved to work for University of Texas. Mm. And now she's designing spaces for medical students. Oh, cool. And it was so cool. And I was like, wow, that's really interesting. I tend to argue about whether or not someone will use that drop down. Right. <laughs> right? You know? Yeah. 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 So it's really interesting just like, oh, there are other possibilities for sure. And I love, I love that idea. Um, so I, I don't want to take too much of your time, but is there anything else that you feel we missed? You feel it's I... awesome for people or? No, you just done. <laughs> I, well, the, the problem the problem is is that I can talk literally forever because uh, this is so much like I yeah, love talking yeah. about stuff like this and yeah. so I'll never stop. I know. So I, I kind of just like I when it's done, it's done. I right. just gotta walk away. Okay. okay, Jason, thank you very much. Absolutely. Good luck to you, man. Thanks, Appreciate man. it. Appreciate